This is Chem 101 Lecture 1.1 at NC State University. In this lecture, we're going to cover units conversion, Avogadro's number, and molecular mass. I believe that students have known about stoichiometry basically since third grade when you were taught about U.S. currency or, if you're an international student, the currency in your country. For U.S. currency, we know that one dollar is equivalent to a hundred pennies. This is a ratio of one to one. If I give a person one dollar and they give me back a hundred pennies, we have made an even exchange. So if I asked you what is the value of $0.37 dollars, I know you wouldn't think very long. You'd say it's 37 pennies, of course. But what if it were a different number? What if one dollar were worth 2,083 pennies? Hmm. Well, then it might take you a little longer to come up with that. Or you could use something called units conversion. Mentally, the conversion you would make if you were asked how many pennies are in $0.37 is you take what you're given, which is $0.37, and multiply it by the ratio of 1 over 1, making sure that the units cancel out. You would multiply by 100 pennies, not divide by 100 pennies, in order to make the units cancel out and come up with 37 pennies. Let's try something a little more challenging. What if I asked you how many nickels are in $5.2? Now, most of you would say to yourself, well, I know that there are 20 nickels in $1. So that'd be 5 times 20, that'd be 100, and then I need 20 cents, so that'd be 4 more, 104. So mentally, what ratio are you using? You're using this ratio, that $1 is equal to 20 nickels. Again, this is a ratio 1 to 1. Now, you could certainly go through the math I just described, but there's a faster way to do it. You could take your $5.2, multiply it by the ratio of 20 nickels divided by $1, and come up with 104 nickels. This would be very fast to type out on your calculator, and it'd be very doable, especially if the ratio weren't so neat. What if there were 27 nickels to a dollar? Well, then it would be much easier to do this particular math operation. So this type of math operation is known as units conversion. You take what you're given, your x somethings, and then you multiply it by a ratio of 1 divided by 1. Y parts per 1 something. This ratio has to be equal to 1 divided by 1, and you need to make sure that your units cancel out. So the somethings cancel out, and you're left with the correct number of parts. This will give you your value that you were asked for. So that brings us to the topic of stoichiometry. Chemistry is almost like operating with currency. It's just that you need to become familiar with our ratios. The ratios that we're going to cover in lecture one are Avogadro's number, atoms in a molecule, mass of a molecule, balancing equations, and mass to moles to mass. In lecture two, we'll pursue that more and go into limiting reagent. So first off, Avogadro's number, also known as the mole. The mass of an individual atom is extremely small. It's on the order of 10 to the minus 24 grams. So when we talk about the mass of an atom, we express it in something called atomic mass units. One atomic mass unit is 1.66 times 10 to the minus 24 grams. Now that is a lot of zeros. 
So you need a very, very special balance if you're going to try and measure out atoms one by one. To make it more complicated, different types of atoms have different masses. For example, carbon has a mass of 12.01, and iron has an average mass of 55.85. So these are the average atomic masses of that type of atom. Don't worry about the integer number, we'll get to that later. So you can't weigh an atomic mass unit on a scale. So we have to take our materials in bunches. It turns out that if you multiply the atomic mass unit by this value, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, you get a value of 1. So this is a very convenient conversion number to give us one group of material. Most of you, I believe, will recognize this bunch. This is known as Avogadro's number, or the mole. It is the chemist dozen. It is the bunch of material that we take our atoms in. So this is convenient because this means the masses in the periodic table can be used for single atoms and moles of atoms. A single carbon atom is likely to weigh an average of 12.01 atomic mass units. A bunch of carbon atoms, quantified as a mole, is going to weigh 12.01 grams. So this makes the periodic table useful for dealing with individual atoms or bunches of atoms. So let's get to some chemistry questions. Suppose you're asked how many iron atoms are in 65.0 grams of iron. Well, you need to know the conversion factor. You can go to any periodic table and find the mass of a mole of iron. I like to use this site, ptable.com, as it has a number of useful functions. If we go to iron, which is shown right here, you see that the mass of a mole of iron is 55.845 grams. So what I can do for my conversion on this question is put 55.85 grams of iron on the bottom of my ratio and 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of iron on top. Let's stop and think about that value for a minute. Is that a ratio of 1 divided by 1? If I gave someone 55.85 grams of iron and they gave me back 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of iron, would that be an even exchange? It would be just like there's a hundred pennies and a dollar. So we're allowed to use this ratio. And what this does is it allows us to cancel out the grams on the bottom and get the number of atoms of iron on the top. Suppose the question changes and you're asked how many moles of iron are in 65 grams of iron. Well, we're still going to start with what we're given, but now we're going to change the ratio to fit the circumstances. So it is true that 55.85 grams of iron is one mole of iron. That is an even exchange. So if we use this ratio and cancel out the grams of iron, we're left with moles of iron. And the answer is 1.16 moles of iron. Here is a question for you to answer. How many moles of phosphorus are in 128 grams of phosphorus? We need to do what we should do with any chemistry question. We're going to write down what we're given. So we can write 128 grams of phosphorus. Now, to get rid of grams of phosphorus, we need to put that on the bottom. We want to get to moles of phosphorus so we can put that on the top. So all we need is whatever this ratio is of 1 over 1 with moles of phosphorus on top and grams of phosphorus on the bottom. 
and I'm sure most of you know where you can get this information. We just need to go visit a periodic table. And we can see here that the mass of one mole of phosphorus is 30.974 grams. One mole of phosphorus and 30.97 grams. So I'm sure you can work that out on your calculator and decide which of these is the best choice. Our next topic is atoms in a molecule. And here, the formula is the key, so you should check the subscripts. Suppose that you have one HNO2 molecule. This tells you that this molecule is composed of one hydrogen atom. When you see no subscript, the implication is there are one of those type. So there would be one nitrogen atom and two oxygen atoms. This ratio holds true even if you have one mole of HNO2 molecules. The ratio is one to one to two, but this time the units are in moles. And the ratios are the same even when you have a decimal value. You notice that 0.33 to 0.33 to 0.66 is a ratio of 1 to 1 to 2. What about parentheses? These can be challenging to students. In this compound right here, we have one calcium atom. For the nitrogen, there's no subscript, so that implies one of them. And then you multiply by the number outside the parentheses. So there are two nitrogen atoms. For oxygen, we have three times two, so there are six oxygen atoms. The same ratio, one to two to six, is true whether or not we're talking about one calcium nitrate compound or one mole of calcium nitrate compound. The units simply change to moles when we're dealing with a mole of material. So here's a question for you. One mole of magnesium phosphate has how many magnesium atoms, how many phosphorus atoms, and how many oxygen atoms? I'll let you work that out. What if you had a slightly more difficult problem? What if you were asked not for one mole, but for 0.35 moles of carbon tetrafluoride? And not only are you asked for moles of carbon atoms and moles of fluorine atoms, but also total moles of atoms. This one I typically need to help students with a little bit. I'm certain you can tell that this carbon tetrafluoride has one mole of carbon. And you can see the four there, so clearly we have four moles of fluorine. For moles of atoms, we just add the two. So there are five moles of atoms in this compound. Now, all you need to do is make sure that you scale this to 0.35 moles of material. You don't have one mole of carbon tetrafluoride, you have 0.35 moles. So just scale these values, and that will help you answer the question. Now, here is an even more complex question. 0.5 moles of O3 has how many molecules and how many oxygen atoms? All right. We're going to have to do two transformations here. First off, we need to go from moles to individual molecules. So we're going to have to use Avogadro's number. We're also going to have to recognize the stoichiometry in the compound between O and O3. So how do we go about doing this one? Here are some ratios that you need to use to answer this question. First off, one O3 molecule 
has three oxygen atoms. Good with that ratio. The next part of this is that one mole of O3 has Avogadro's number of molecules. So those are the ratios that you're going to need. Our last topic in this section is mass of a molecule. So if you're familiar with U.S. currency, you know that a quarter is worth 25 cents, a dime worth 10 cents, a nickel worth 5 cents, and a penny worth 1 cent. So if you had in your hand one quarter, two nickels, and two pennies, I think you would know how much change that is. So I've deliberately sort of written this in sort of chemical formula, right? This is the molecule QN2P2, which means one quarter, two nickels, two pennies. If you're asked, how much is this worth in currency? You're going to do this mental exercise. You're going to say, okay, one quarter worth 25 cents, two nickels each worth five cents, two pennies each worth one cent. There is your 37 cents. This is the operation we're going to need to use for mass of a molecule. We're just going to add up the masses of the component parts. So if you have one calcium nitrate compound, if you went to the periodic table, you would see the number 40.078 next to calcium. There it is. We'll also need nitrogen, which is 14.007, and oxygen, which is 15.999. So you notice I'm working in units of atomic mass units. That's because I'm dealing with one calcium nitrate compound. That means it's so tiny I couldn't even see it if it were in my hand. I'm not working with a mole of material. I'm working with just one calcium nitrate compound. Therefore, I am using atomic mass units. As mentioned previously, we need the mass of the nitrogen. There are two nitrogen atoms, and each one is 14.007 AMUs on average, and six oxygen atoms. So all I did was take the number, multiply it by the atomic mass units, and now I'm going to add it up. One calcium nitrate compound weighs, on average, 164.086 atomic mass units. If I were dealing with one mole of calcium nitrate, then the only thing that would change is the units. I would switch from AMUs to grams. So here is your question. 0.784 moles of magnesium phosphate. Please give the mass. So in a previous question, you should know how many magnesiums, phosphoruses, and oxygens are in this compound. My only caution to you is you're not being asked for one mole. You're being asked for 0.784 moles. So once you get the mass of one mole, make sure that you adapt it so that you are scaling it or proportioning it for 0.784 moles.